Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode in my efforts to go through uh, things related to my big book, New Kind of Science, that came out uh, 20 years ago on May 14th of this year. Um, I've been, uh, I spent uh, a little bit more than 12 weeks going through the 12 chapters of the book and talking about what's in them. Um, I then have turned to talking about a piece that I wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago now about the making of the book. And I have gone through most of that um, uh, rather elaborate story of the actual construction of the 1200 pages or so that are in the book and the pictures that are uh, contained there. And I had gotten on to a uh, later section of what I had written about uh, the making of the book. Uh, it's a section called The Lost Epilogue and other outtakes from the book. The book had 12 chapters, but actually there was a 13th chapter that existed in the book up until fairly close to the end. And um, that 13th chapter, I had kind of pretty much forgotten about that chapter. And um, the title of that chapter was The Future of the Science in This Book. So let me um, perhaps um, uh, open this up here. This was the, um, and, and remember, of course, this is just a draft. This never made it into the final book. So this was just a preliminary version of the future of the science in this book, the epilogue. Well, now we're 20 years later. And so now the future, we can talk a little bit about that future and um, what was there. In fact, okay, so I, I'm commenting December 15th, 2000. So just a couple of years before the year and a half before the book uh, came out. Um, it, um, uh, I still am planning this epilogue to the book. And um, the actually the epilogue, well, let, let, let's talk about what was in that epilogue, sort of the lost epilogue. Um, it had a variety of sections. There was a section about um, uh, absorbing the contents of the book and um, talking about, um, uh, uh, you know, while I've made every effort to present what I've done with the greatest of clarity, I fully expect that many years will pass before it has all been widely absorbed. Now, remember, these are draft comments, so they're a bit more rough hewn and uncensored than anything that would make it into the final book. But um, I, I did talk about um, uh, the, um, I, I talked about things like, um, the character of the new intellectual enterprise around this new kind of science and uh, the fact that uh, um, I say that, that creating the science I describe in this book over the past 20 years has been a largely solitary undertaking. Um, but uh, if what I've created is now to emerge as a major intellectual activity and a significant force in the intellectual world, then inevitably a, ho a whole community of people must become involved. And I talk about, I have some discussion about the role of professional science versus quotes amateur science and its importance in thinking about a uh, new, new kind of science. You know, I think one of the things I was realizing this just recently, if you look at kind of major changes that get made in science, I just wonder what fraction of people who make them are, are actually not deeply embedded in the procedural processes of typical science. I mean, I think that science in the enterprise of the size that it is today has a great deal of proceduralism in it. And there's a question of when one is going to make a larger jump, which is what I was trying to do with New Kind of Science. Uh, you know, is that something that is even plausible from within the kind of the, the, the structure of sort of procedural science? And, and I myself have had the, the sort of unusual experience of kind of, uh, uh, of alternating between doing what is essentially uh, technology development and basic science about five times so far in my life, that alternation, um, and uh, uh, sort of given me a, a somewhat different ability or perspective on making kind of bigger jumps in science, because in a sense, I don't do it for a living. I'm not part of the kind of procedural process. I make tools for, for people who, I make a living making tools for people who do it for a living, so to speak. But um, it is, in a sense, I'm, I'm a bit freer to, uh, to think more broadly about, about science than perhaps if I was deeply embedded in the kind of proceduralism of it. But one thing that I commented on in the, in the lost epilogue to New Kind of Science 
was the 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 possibility of doing kind of of making contributions to the science uh, without having had this kind of giant educational tower of scientific knowledge um, and uh, and really talk about the fact that in a new kind of science uh, the the deep professionals don't have really any advantage because there aren't there isn't it's a new science one's still exploring things right at the frontier and so it becomes much more feasible for people to make contributions um, even though they're not kind of uh, they haven't climbed the whole some whole educational tower as is needed in, in a lot of traditional areas of science well I continued talking about in the in the lost epilogue I um kind of uh, um uh, the what should be done now was one section. So I, I have various suggestions. And, and again, remember, this is sort of rough hewn text. So I, I said, what will survive best is the most general, abstract, yet simple. For this is one of the lessons of the history of science. Mathematics has, for the most part, steadily built on its earlier results. But most other fields have gone through a series of revolutions in which older knowledge is discarded. Kind of the point there that I'm making is a point that I would now make very strongly about ruleology, kind of the study of systems based on simple rules, kind of one of the core uh, ideas of new kind of science. The idea that when there is simple, um, when, when one is studying something simple and essential, it is more likely to survive than something which one is studying that's based on some sort of, sort of big tower of particulars. Um, I, I listed in, uh, in the lost epilogue, and again, these are these are very rough notes, which I, I wouldn't stand by the words of, but um, a sort of a list of principles about um, doing the science. Always try to address the most obvious questions and find the simplest examples. In other words, there may be some very obscure and very sophisticated question that uh, you know would build on some tower of detailed um, academic studies, but that is probably not the most obvious question. I have to say, in my in my own experience in studying a variety of different fields, the strategy of saying what is the core question of this field, can we address it, has been a very fertile kind of approach. So I, I suggest always try to address the most obvious questions and find the simplest examples. Try to understand the root causes of things. Do not be satisfied with technical explanations. Um, do not be bound by what has been done before, but try to understand it as fully as possible and explain what you have done as clearly as possible and with as little infrastructure as possible. I suppose we could take these, uh, as I say, rather rough hewn statements as a, as a pretty good uh, a pretty good summary of kind of the the, the sort of uh, the, the meta approach that I was trying to take with, with new kind of science. Um, okay, this was a, this was something I, I'm sure I just wrote this out in, in a minute. And so I, without as much thought as I, as I could have put into it, um, I, I just sort of was, was um, guessing something about the future phases of new science. And, and um, uh, so I kind of say absorption, try to understand what I've done in the book. First absorption completes in two years, more in five years. Well, I don't know about that. Make the first rounds of extensions, two to three years finished in 10 to 15 years. Build major new directions, 15 to 30 years. Small scale technology, four to 10 years. Major technology, 10 to 25. Become part of everyday thought, four to 10. Become part of basic science education, 15 to 20 years. So some of these I, I think were, were uh, fairly accurate in terms of timing, some very optimistic. Um, and I think the, the one that is kind of interesting is the major, build major new directions, 15 to 30 years. Well, at 20 years or at 18 years or something, that's when we kind of hit, I would say, the next major kind of notion that came out of our physics project and the whole multi-computational paradigm and so on. I would say that some aspects of this are... Um, I mean, uh, technological applications, four to 10 years, yup. Um, we certainly used a bunch of this kind of exploring the computational universe, searching for programs. And then Wolfram Alpha came out at year seven relative to um, uh, the, the release of New Kind of Science. And it was, as I explained before, sort of philosophically inspired by the ideas of a New Kind of Science. Um, I would say that uh, uh, although it wasn't, I think, a direct historical path, the um, the kind of the the direction of things like deep learning um, is very much in the search of the computational universe, although not 
with as simple programs as I describe in, in, in NKS. Um, I think that remains a connection still to be made of to what extent the, the sort of richness, just as we have discovered that very simple programs can lead to very rich behavior, to what extent can the richness of what's been done in, in areas like neural nets where you might have a, a million or a billion uh, you know, degrees of freedom for the neural nets be, be similarly uh, emergent from something simple like that. This one, become a standard part of science education. That's been a bit of a, of a kind of a side story. I mean, that is people saying, oh, look, you can study cellular automata and here's how they work. Yup, that's in there. That, that made it, I think, a little bit ahead of that schedule. Um, but the deeper sort of notion of kind of a, a um, uh, sort of NKS as a pre-computer science, that's still not there. I mean, the notion that you can learn about kind of simple programs and what they do, it's, it's something you can, you know, at a very elementary school-ish level, you can be sort of making, you know, running cellular automata by hand. I haven't done them very often by hand. Um, one of my kids was a little bit into them uh, for a while. Um, and uh, 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 she's now a mathematician. So, so I don't know what that, what, what, um, uh, uh, what you conclude from that. But um, I would say that the, um, uh, I think the thing that um, has uh, uh, th this, this notion that sort of following algorithmic rules, look, you can do complicated things with them. That's sort of an interesting intuitive notion that can be introduced very early educationally. And then the very fact that you can make these pictures and gosh, they look like the, the patterns that mollusks put on their shells and so on. That's, that's pretty neat because you actually don't get to with the sort of traditional developments of physics and things like that beyond just being told, oh, there's this law and it makes parabolic trajectories and things like that. You don't get to see that until a much later stage of education. And this notion of really understanding at, um, uh, the, the, the kind of the concept of, of, of computational rules and what they do is something that could be introduced much earlier in the educational process. In terms of sort of the effect on everyday thought, the phenomenon of computational irreducibility is kind of a, a, a key phenomenon and people who have been sort of exposed to, oh, you've got the simple program, run it, see what it does, can you predict what it does? No, you can't. That's the story of computational irreducibility. That's an important intuitional step that certainly could be introduced much earlier in the educational process. I, I would say that I think perhaps I mentioned it here, perhaps I have not. Um, something that I realized only very recently is if I look at kind of the arc of my own development of the kind of things that led to new kind of science in the 1980s, when I started studying cellular automata, um, the, the methods that I brought to bear were essentially methods for mathematical physics. And I got a bunch of other people interested in things like cellular automata at the same time. And they also brought methods from essentially mathematical physics to bear. And what happened was they got stuck. We all got stuck. Mathematical physics didn't work in studying things like cellular automata. And I think what I realize is, the, in retrospect, 40 years afterwards, I realize in a sense, one of the, the most significant thing perhaps that I ended up doing was not just saying, oh, I got stuck, let's stop. But I said, the very fact that we got stuck is itself the main event. The fact that one has this barrier, this barrier of computational irreducibility, that is the key story. And that's the story that existing science does not help you with. But there is, to quote the title of the book, a new kind of science that is based on the realization that sort of computation is a fundamental uh, paradigm and that one of its consequences is this phenomenon of computational irreducibility, which is this kind of the, the in-your-face evidence of the importance of, of something computational. So in any case, I think that that's a thing where, where gradually I, I've noticed that among younger folk who are sort of in, in, um, uh, involved with um, science that, that uh, we've been doing and even technology, that computational irreducibility begins to be something that people take for granted. Of course, it works that way. Uh, it was, yes, I think it's, and of course it works that way, but I've been living it for 40 years. And um, I think that as, as people understand that notion of computational irreducibility, it has a very 
uh, interesting consequence for the very view of science that one has, because in a sense, in a world where where it's all about reducibility, it's all about can we get science to tell us, be able to make us produce a narrative that lets us jump ahead and predict what's going to happen. That story is a story of computational reducibility. And in a sense, that's the story that science has been writing for the last 300 years, because it's the story that kind of came in when mathematical methods were able to introduce computational reduce, what I would now call computational reducibility. Um, it's a different story now that we see computational irreducibility. And, and that's a, it's kind of a story of the success of science showing its own limitations and showing us kind of the, the, the uh, perhaps the end of this period where we can say of science, look, it will allow us to predict everything about what's going to happen in the world. That's, that is, uh, we should be more humble about um, sort of our role, the, the effect of our intellect, so to speak, um, on being able to understand the world. I think, in a sense, the principle of computational equivalence, kind of a core idea of new kind of science, um, is ultimately the expression of, in a sense, that humility, so to speak, in the sense that it says, look, everything is computationally equivalent, including our brains and our mathematics and the natural world. So we are not sort of above the natural world in the way that we had come to think we might be based on sort of existing ideas in science. So that's kind of the the, the philosophy of that. Um, I think, uh, and, and as I say, I think that the the importance of computational irreducibility as a sort of uh, as a as a kind of a building block for thinking about the world is something that is gradually starting to be seen. I mean, I think it has the same kind of role, perhaps that you know in. In mechanics, for example, the idea of something of momentum as a way of thinking about how things work in the world, whether it's the momentum of a product, which has nothing to do with its physical being thrown somewhere, but has to do with the sort of the concept of momentum as, a, as an inertia that causes the motion to continue, um, is, is something that uh, sort of is an intuitional thing about the world, just as I think computational irreducibility is an intuitional thing about the world that's perhaps a little bit more directly connected than something like momentum and its analogies in, in things other than mechanical motion. Well, um, I think, uh, uh, okay, so in, in, the, in the lost epilogue, there was another piece of the lost epilogue, which was the notes to the lost epilogue. It's like there was both an epilogue and there were notes at the back of the epilogue. And I think here, oh, do I have a, a blow up of this? No, I don't think I do. Uh, at the back, there were, how many? Um, uh, 283 open questions that I had posed uh, related to the different chapters of the book. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of a little bit sad that that uh, I never put those out there because in 20 years, there could have been all kinds of people who would have come upon these. And I know uh, um, at least one data point of uh, one of the, uh, the, the sort of uh, people who was deeply instrumental in our physics project as a high school student had come across some sort of open problems that I had defined based on the NKS book, not these ones. Um, and had found those inspirational. So, so uh, it, you know, more seeds could have been planted there. And I'm sort of disappointed in a sense that I didn't surface uh, these, um, these sort of open questions. Now I did write a thing, um, uh, uh, where is the link to it? I did write, um, um, huh, I don't have a link here. I should have a link here. Um, there is a, um, um, uh, I did put out an open problems and projects, um, but I only managed to make it, let's see if I can um, get here to that. I believe it's, it's on the web. Um, and let's see, resources, here we go. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, here we go. First installment of key problems. Now I'm 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 really embarrassed about this because this was in uh, it says as of June 26th, 2003, it was prepared for the very first of our uh, uh, summer schools, what's now the Wolfram Summer School, um, back in 2003, and I was you know 
uh, tried hard to get there to, to, to do this. And it goes chapter by chapter, uh, providing these different questions. And th this is, this is as, I, as I'm showing, it's out available on the web. But I didn't get very far. I only got to, I think, chapter four here. And I had got, in sort of the lost notes to the epilogue, I had got through many more chapters, although not as densely covered. Um, and, you know, here I've, I've got uh, that each of these things has sort of an encoding of... Um, uh, Okay, that's a that's a funky one. Investigate net, nested radical representation of numbers. It has a two book, which means that's the amount of sort of uh, traditional knowledge you need to have, and uh, a one clock. That's the amount of time that it might take to make progress on these things, um, and uh, that's a three book one clock uh, problem, um, and so on. But unfortunately, oh look at that! It just goes splat at that point. That must have been the day that the first summer school started and I stopped working on this. Oh, look, and that one is, is still is now sparse. So it's really something I, I'd love to get feedback, actually, of, of uh, you know, should I should I really make an effort to um, um, uh, to, to do this um, uh, again? Well, anyway, so so that was um, uh, that was the in terms of material that was in the book. Um, there was this lost epilogue that almost made it into the book, but didn't quite. Um, the uh, 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 in terms of other other kinds of things, well, let, let me show you a couple of things. There was a lot of material during the time that I was working on the the NKS book, the decade that I worked specifically on the book. I pretty much, the things I did were things for the book and everything I did made it into the book, roughly. However, I have 40 boxes of archive material as well as a huge amount of online material, but I have 40 boxes of physical paper that I generated um, during that time. Um, and uh, uh, I decided when I was, a few weeks ago, when I was when I was writing this piece about the making of NKS, I decided I'll pull one of these boxes down and I'll open it up. It's sealed. It's been sealed for, for um, in this case of this box, it's been sealed for close to 30 years. You know, break open the seal and, um, and look inside. And pretty much the, the first page I saw said this. And it's like, oh my gosh, I've been doing the same thing all my life because I just wrote something last year about numerical multiway systems using an example that was not that different from that one. And um, going through this box, it's kind of funny that that um, look at that multiway Turing machine. I just wrote about those last year. This is this is a box from 1993, multiway string rewrite. Um, more plausible correspondence with math proofs. I say there in 1993. Um, and uh, uh, oh yeah, there's I mean there's a lot of drafts of different pieces. Um, that's a section that never made it to um, uh, to the final NKS book. A section about a new intuition about numbers, which has kind of a resonance with a piece that I wrote uh, last year about how inevitable is the concept of numbers. Um, then uh, uh, get to these kinds of graphics, which why for some reason they're not they're not expanding here. I don't know why not. Um, but uh, those graphics are, in a sense, timeless graphics. You know, you don't know when that was made. In fact, that graphic is the top of what has become the illustration for the book on 20 Years of NKS that we're putting out um, in a few months. Um, and that graphic there, you know, it, it doesn't look any different as it was made in 1992 or 1993 than it would today. These are timeless things. Um, of course, as I look through this sheets of paper, I find that one piece of paper says uh, 32 megabytes of RAM, one gigabyte local disk. That must have been the characteristics of some computer I was getting. That has dated. Um, the, uh, this is uh, talking about computational reducibility and the principle of computational equivalence. So uh, obviously this, this kind of uh, nails down, yes, 1993, I really had that um, uh, that that idea and, and definitions of randomness and so on as a consequence. Well, so uh, that was just the first inch or two 
of the first of 40 boxes and I haven't had the, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too strange an activity to go through these things. I also haven't scanned these boxes. I, I, have, um, I have scans of about a quarter million pages of other physical documents that were slightly more sort of higher, uh, higher significance documents. But I think I'm now convinced that I have to scan these boxes as well. Unfortunately, a lot of what's in them is handwritten. And so that's not yet amenable to optical character recognition kinds of approaches. Although we're getting closer and um, I'm hoping that we will be able to train some machine learning systems based on particularly handwritten material of mine where we have the handwritten version and we have the typed version that goes along with it. Well, so uh, I wanted to talk about, well, a couple more things here. I was going to talk about, um, well, in the, in the piece that I wrote about the making of NKS, I talk a little bit about what happens um, when, what, what happened when the book came out. Um, the, uh, uh, I mentioned um, there are 376 people listed in the acknowledgements at the front of New Kind of Science. And I suppose there's a story for every single one of them. There's a story of what was the interaction that I had with that person. There's often material from it and so on as well. And, and so that, those are stories not, not told yet. Um, but uh, the, um, in terms of the physical production of the book, at the very back of the book, there's a colophon that has in great detail the things that I had talked about in this making of a new kind of science about how it's uh, image director plates at 2400 DPI using a 175 line screen with round dots angled at 45 degrees and so on. I'm glad I put that in there because I might have forgotten that by now. And that's those are fun things. And, and here are some of the people who are involved in, in the uh, uh, in the sort of mechanical creation of of the um, of the book. Um, as opposed to people who are listed in the acknowledgements at the beginning, who were involved with um, uh, with sort of the, the the conceptual aspects, and I mean, I, I you know, this is the acknowledgements, the beginning of the acknowledgements, and um, it's uh, it's a long list, um, and I think um, uh, uh, I kind of acknowledge at the beginning that the creation of the book was a big personal undertaking, spanning the better part of half my life so far. Um, it, for it to be possible has required a series of particular personal circumstances. Foremost among them is that I've lived at the moment in history when technology has first made it possible to do the kinds of things I've done. But also crucial has been my early successes in science and business that uh, have allowed me to pursue the sort of personal intellectual objectives that I've, uh, that I've chosen. Um, and so I, I kind of talk a little bit about, um, about that uh, here. And um, um, uh, and start mentioning lots and lots of people who are involved in different ways in um, in that journey, um, both in terms of uh, uh, contributing, you know, uh, uh, contributing kind of, um, I would say, often contributing things that I, telling me things that I didn't know, sometimes telling me things that that they didn't know, where I was curious whether some field or another had something to say about this or that thing. And on talking to the world expert in that field and having them tell me, no, we do not know anything about this, that was extremely useful. And, and so sometimes in a sense, some of the people in this list are people uh, for whom it's um, the main thing I learned was that, uh, that they didn't know something. Um, and that was highly useful um, in, um, uh, in this. I, I, I think we've been tracking the number of people here who are um, who are still alive, and it's still the majority. I'm happy to say. Um, well, let's see. Back to back to the um, sort of the after story of the book. Uh, uh, oh yes, that was a nice award that the paper company that made the kind of paper that the book used uh, gave us for an innovative use of its paper. And um, the uh, Publishers Weekly, I had mentioned, I think last time, the um, uh, um, uh, the the um, uh, the kind of the the publishing story of of the book, and um, it's sort of uh, and it was kind of uh, kind of kind of cute that the main uh, uh, trade magazine of publishing industry, uh, Publishers Weekly, ran a piece called "The New Kind of Self Publishing," talking about the success of the NKS book, which I thought was very charming. Um, 
and uh, actually had some interesting facts that I had not, um, I'm not sure I read this piece at the time when it came out, but it had some interesting facts that I wasn't, um, uh, wasn't immediately aware of. Um, let's see. So, yeah, well, that was uh, me signing books. And then we made a big poster. I think there's some, some of these posters still available. A poster that is sort of printed, high-resolution printing of a poster where you can actually read every word of the NKS book on this poster, um, although you need a magnifying glass. Computational irreducibility-inspired bookmarks. I use these all the time. Um, we we kept a virtual machine of the environment that was used to actually produce the NKS book. And I, we hadn't really cracked that open for 20 years. And I'm happy to say it did still run. And so we were able to run things like FrameMaker and uh, some of the other software. The, the, the software, all the Wolfram language material um, is all nicely sort of time invariant. And the stuff that was created in the early 1990s still runs today and the notebooks still read in and so on. That's not true of some of the other technology that we had. And I'm glad we created this virtual machine to make a sort of time capsule of that. We had done things within a year or two after New Kind of Science. Um, we had uh, started to kind of expose some of the programs that were used. We had a product called New Kind of Science Explorer, complete with a CD-ROM that had uh, essentially programs from the uh, from the book presented as uh, uh, as as manipulate as as dynamic interactive um, um, things in Wolfram language. Uh, many of the pieces of material in, in NKS Explorer became part of our demonstrations project a couple of years later. Um, and uh, uh, we also have, well, things happened like uh, the NKS book made it onto the iPad in 2010. And um, now we have an increasingly elaborate, uh, uh, we've always had this, um, we've had for a long time, an online version of the NKS book. Um, one of the things we've been working on quite hard recently is making all of the pictures click to copy in the sense that you can take an image from the book and just copy it. Let me actually show you a little bit about how that works. Um, let's, uh, um, let's go there. Let's say we go to one of the pages here. I'm going to live dangerously and just pick a random page and see if it actually works. Um, let's go to this page here. And let's take a picture here, and let's look at this. We can click it. Oh, uh, this is a this is a lose. Um, what this says is copy symbolic graphics, and so that will take the um, the actual Wolfram language graphics expression that represents that uh, that image, and rather than copying the thing as something like a PDF, it copies as some. Um, uh, let's see if I can do this here. Wake up, computer. Um, huh. It's odd. Very odd. Okay, I'm on here. Up. Oh, there we go. I don't know why this is running so slowly. Okay. All right. Let's take um, this. Is I think I must be running the pre release version. Um, of of language here. Uh, let's see. Let's paste this in here. Oh, that's no fun at all. It just says cloud get. That's um, that's. But this will get hopefully. Ah, yes. This is a yeah. Okay. So that gets the actual graphics expression that um, uh, represents that output. So it's arbitrarily high resolution. But what it doesn't have here. Uh, which is kind of a shame for this page and something we're really trying to work on throughout the um, the NKS book. Let's see if this one has it. Um, okay, here we go. Um, this has, in the click to copy, it says copy code to clipboard. And this has, if I go here and I copy that, it actually has a piece of uh, Wolfram language code that generates the appropriate image here, or it generates a kind of an interpreted version of that image because, for example, I made the decision that we'll, we'll go with whatever the modern defaults are, which might not be the same as, for example, gray level. It uses color and things like that. But the goal is, and, and we're actually looking for people who'd like to help us make this a reality, to take the thousand or so images in the NKS book and make uh, good code for all of them. We have code for all of them, but some of it, it rests on this 
quite big tower of special purpose uh, 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 packages and things that that I created. We created in the in the building of the of the NKS book, and we would like to, as much as possible, untangle that so that it's possible to have as direct as possible click to copy code um, for the um, uh, uh, for the book. So. Um, Let's see, I was uh, back to this. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, I, I mentioned some of the things that were sort of fun in, um, um, in the book itself. There are some general notes at the back of the book that I think I went through some of um, on a previous session here, um, but it's kind of fun to see some of those like, like um, there's there's one where I where I talk about an effort to make the main text of this book as timeless as possible. I generally avoided referring to everyday systems whose character or name I expect will change as technology advances. And uh, I was just looking for some of those um, recently in the book, uh, electronic address books. I mentioned that's not really a thing anymore. MP3 as described as a recent format and so on. Um, one question is, Okay, the NKS book came out 20 years ago. What was wrong in it? You know, it was it was a a kind of a a, a kind of an echo of a paradigm shift that um, some people would say of it when the book came out. Ah, oh, what's in it is wrong, uh, and um, uh, you know, one could be amused by that because it's like, what aspect of it is wrong? You mean that the the pixel that you got by running this program isn't the pixel that that uh, the book says you get by running that program no surely you don't mean that and and it's you know in the in the ways of uh, the cynical academic would say you know it's uh, people complain about things of being it's either it's wrong or it's been done before or it's both wrong and it's been done before well uh i was pretty careful in the nks book and i don't think there's a lot in it that's wrong um and uh, we've sort of tracked the detailed um, uh, sort of errata, and they're pretty minor, actually. Um, the uh, this is this is a piece of tracking here. Um, things that were changed in the second printing. There was a, a thing that was a um, uh, why is R greater than S? R greater than or equal to S plus one? Why is that even? Necessary. I don't even know. Anyway, but that looked like there were some actual um, mistakes here that were fixed mostly in the second printing here, some to the first printing, a typo, things like that. Um, uh, there are very few of these that have sort of survived and people have pointed out over the years that are fixed in the online version of NKS. People ask if there'll be a second edition of NKS. Um, and I've always said no, and I, I still say no. Um, I think that NKS, I, I worked very hard to make it a sort of this timeless statement of what it could talk about. And it is in a sense rather complete for what it is. And what comes later is sort of the next step, so to speak. Um, in, the, in the piece that I wrote about making of NKS, we did a search on the web. This was kind of fun for places where the NKS book shows up in pictures. And it's really quite fun. It's, it's, uh, you see it on a lot of bookshelves, including a lot of celebrity bookshelves. We, we didn't show here the, uh, the people who were often in these pictures as well, um, whose bookshelves these were on, but there's a, there's a, a remarkable collection of celebrity bookshelves, so to speak, um, on, on which you can find the NKS book. And, and uh, this, uh, the black and yellow sp thick spine is, is rather easy to pick out. Um, I think uh, from my early idea of um, let's um, uh, let's have uh, let's have a sort of an, an eye that looks at people, which was kind of a creepy, weird idea. Um, it turned out that the final black and yellow spine is is uh, is distinctive enough to be able to pick it out in many places. Well, so that was the story of sort of the making of the NKS book. Um, I wrote a piece also a couple of weeks ago here about um, the greater implications of, of the book and what I've sort of learnt over the last 20 years um, about sort of the trajectory from the book. And, and I think the, um, uh, the, the picture at the top kind of summarizes some of that. I should say that one of the things that has been one of the more bizarre experiences for me in the last couple of years, as I have returned to doing basic science, there are some loose ends, some footnotes in, in NKS that I thought I should really finish this footnote now. 
I care about it. Things like multi-way systems based on numbers, things like the empirical metamathematics of Euclid, things like multi-way Turing machines, things about combinators, things about the game of tag, the, um, the, the post-tag systems and so on. Um, these are things that were essentially footnotes in NKS. And it's been a bit shocking to me that in the last couple of years, I've, I've explored some of those in connection with some of the things we've done that have come out of the physics project. And they've almost all turned into these 50, 100 page kinds of documents that all grew out of the seed that was one note, one footnote in the NKS book. There's a lot there to explore. And I find it interesting. I mean, at our summer schools over the years and summer camps and so on, uh, people have done a certain amount of the exploration uh, from those seeds and people in the academic literature have also done that. But there is much more to cultivate there. There are many more seeds that have many more things that can be explored based on just literally the one sentence in the notes to the NKS book, which often was a sentence that came out of quite a lot of thinking and quite a tower of things that I built, but that's kind of the seed for a really, really much larger story um, that, uh, that can be told. Now, in terms of the core methodology of, of NKS, recently I've kind of invented two terms that I think capture some part of that core methodology, ruleology and metamodeling. Ruleology is the pure basic science of studying simple programs and what they do. And uh, we're, we're planning to really develop that field. Uh, there are a lot of people who we've been able to identify from their academic publications and their websites and things like that, who over the last few decades have really been pursuing ruleology, the study of the, the specifics of what simple programs actually do. Um, and we really want to kind of bring that together as a, as a field that um, can sort of share uh, sort of share common threads and so on. And, and I hope that there will start to be, you know, professors of ruleology and departments and courses and so on about ruleology. It is, in a sense, the most basic, basic science in many ways. It's something, you know, if you think of mathematics as a basic science, this is, in a sense, still more basic. Mathematics builds on a much taller tower of specific rules that people have constructed for mathematical purposes, which may resonate in some deep way with the, with the ways that we think about the universe. That's kind of the point of, of my work on the physicalization of metamathematics recently. But I think that the, the thing that um, uh, is um, uh, that, that, in a sense, ruleology lies below kind of the, the kinds of things that are about mathematics. Put about it, th thought about it in a different way. We now talk about the Ruliad as the entangled limit of all possible computational processes, the thing of which the universe and our experience of it is but a slice through the Ruliad. Um, the, the, uh, um, it's, in a sense, Ruliology is Rulial space travel. The, the experience that we have kind of near us that makes use of our common senses and our kind of uh, the kinds of things we've thought about in traditional physics and so on, that is the kind of local exploration of Ruleal space. But to kind of explore just that arbitrary program that is arbitrarily different is kind of a jump through Ruleal space. And there's no reason to think that we can understand where we land after that jump through Ruleal space. And often we do not. And that's, in a sense, the the concept of, of NKS is what you learn, the science you learn from understanding, uh, among other things, the fact that you will not understand, you will be confronted with things like computational irreducibility when you try and make that jump across Ruleal space. But in a sense, Ruleology is Ruleal space travel. It is trying to explore parts of the Rulead that are not ones that are closely connected to the particular sampling of the Ruliad that we have currently done. And as we, uh, I think what will happen is that we will see kind of the colonization of the Ruliad through Ruliology, that there are pieces of the Ruliad, there are pieces of, of Rulial space that we realize that's a really fertile one. We could perhaps have even built our civilization over here, but we didn't but we can grow something which we can then import as useful for our actual civilization. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing to think about if things like cellular automata had been as they could have been, kind of uh, 
uh, started to be studied in Babylonian times, how would the history of science have been different? And the sequence that we've seen from kind of the structural paradigm for science of, you know, what are things made of, to the mathematical paradigm of the 1600s, to the computational paradigm of the 1980s, to now this multi-computational paradigm, what would have happened if things like the cellular automata of, of NKS had been known and widely widely played with, so to speak, in Babylonian times, would that sequencing of the sort of arrival of the mathematical paradigm been the same as it, as it, as it in fact was historically? I suspect not. I suspect that what would have happened is that people would first have discovered the computational paradigm. They might have even have discovered computers first. And sometimes somebody would have pointed out, oh my gosh, there's this way of thinking about this that involves looking at what we now think of as mathematics. That would have been the second, that would have been the, the third paradigm instead of the second paradigm. And that's sort of a, a feature of, of potentially of, of living somewhere else in the Ruliad, so to speak. And I strongly suspect that there are other kind of uh, colonies that can be built in the Ruliad in a sense that sort of the, the alien intelligence idea is that, and that's a that's a way of, of, um, of thinking about what Ruliology is, it's this kind of rulial exploration um, of, of kind of what else is out there um, in, in rulial space. And I think one of the things that has recently been realized is that this effort in the physicalization of metamathematics kind of shows us that our mathematics, like our physics, is deeply woven around our human experience. And the fact that we make use of the, the fact that our higher mathematics is possible is happens, as I've argued, for the same reason as we believe in space. We believe in continuum space. We similarly believe that there is a kind of a, a way of representing higher mathematics that doesn't always bring you down deeply far below the, even the axioms of mathematics as it exists today. And that, that fact that mathematics, higher mathematics is possible is kind of the same statement I claim as the fact that we perceive space as a thing and we perceive continuum space and so on, rather than the, the world being shattered into this kind of infinite collection of, uh, not quite infinite, but um, very large number of, of, uh, of atoms of space and so on. Well, in the kind of development of, uh, um, of new kind of science, the, um, uh, it's um, um, the thing that has sort of emerged only in, in rather recent times and as a result of the physics project is this kind of um, uh, fourth paradigm. So, you know, from new kind of science, there were seeds of the physics project in the book. Pretty good seeds, actually. Seeds which should have been growable, but were not. And they were not growable because they needed a new paradigm, and it just wasn't the paradigm that most people who were interested in physics and sufficiently knowledgeable about physics were pursuing. And so that was that was kind of the um, uh, the thing that um, um, uh, had to wait for eighteen years or so um, to for for um, NKS to grow up in some sense. Um, to really launch the physics project, um, which started in earnest in the in the fall of 2019, um, the physics project is kind of I think the next big thing that's emerged from new kind of science, and that has led from the computational paradigm, the paradigm where we talk about simple rules and the consequences that they have, to this multi-computational paradigm where we're thinking about collections of different rules in a sense, and their entangled consequences. We're thinking not just about individual computations and the irreducibility of what they do, but collections of computations and their sort of entangled character. And a term, actually, this is a James Boyd term, I guess, is, is um, uh, a multi-computational irreducibility, recently invented term to describe sort of the, the sense in which even in kind of the branchial space that goes across different uh, uh, different sort of threads of of time, the the uh, the, the difficulty of kind of uh, of 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 untangling what's going on there is kind of the the multi computational analog of computational irreducibility, 
and actually I've just recently last couple of weeks been working on a a development of a footnote from a new kind of science and new kind of science there's a small footnote about games and their relationship to multiway systems and I mentioned tic-tac-toe and I mentioned the fact that it's sort of game graph is a multiway graph well I just decided to really nail that down as a way to sort of develop the intuition for um uh for uh this multi-computational process and I'm I'm almost finished with a rather large tome about um, lots of games. I'm not myself a very good player of these kinds of uh, games and puzzles and so on. I, I think I'm 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 a looker at their multi-way graphs rather than a looker at their at the actual playing of of, of uh, you know move this peg from here to there. But in any case, that that's um, um, that's kind of a a a piece of what's emerged now. Now, in general, I would say that the sort of progression from, from NKS through the physics project to the realization of this general paradigm of multi-computation to the uh, realization of the Rouliad, and also right now to the spin-off of the Metamathematics project. The Rouliad, in a sense, responds to a long time thing that I was very confused about. I mean, I always wondered, if we succeed in the physics project and we have a thing that we can sort of hold in our hand and say, this is the rule for our universe, we then have what one might think of as an almost theological question of why this rule and not another. Why, why did we get this one for our universe? And that's the thing where so often in science, the way a question like that is resolved is not by a frontal assault. It's not, okay, we're gonna figure out why it's that rule. Actually, it's because the question is not well formulated. The real story of the Rouliad is it's all rules. It is just that we sample, we as observers like us, well, as, as, our, as us particularly as observers, we sample a particular part of this Rouliad that represents the entangled limit of all possible rules or possible computations. And the big fact of the physics project is that there is some generosity in what we will observe in our sampling of the Rouliad. It could be the case that every different sampling of the Rouliad, every different alien intelligence, so to speak, would observe utterly different physics, and that we would have to know which particular sampling of the Rouliad do we have in order to be able to explain our physics. But one of the big results is that that's not true. As soon as we know that we are computationally bounded, as soon as we have our belief in persistence through time, it follows that we will generically observe the kind of uh, the kind of effects that correspond to general relativity and quantum mechanics. That those will emerge um, just from that those very general properties of us as observers. So it sort of resolves in a very unexpected way this kind of post Copernican problem of why did we get this particular apparently special universe. You know, I think it's a it's a realization that the kind of the the NKS story is a story of the computational paradigm. It's you can think about the world in a computational way, and here's how you think about anything computationally, and here's how in the NKS book, here's some of the connections you can make to existing things that we've studied in science in computational terms. I think that the the big kind of uh, realization from the physics project is the increasing evidence that the world really is computational all the way down. And that is the realization, which is sort of the analog for the computational paradigm of kind of the Copernican story for the mathematical paradigm. In a sense, the Copernican story was a story, look, we can do mathematics. We can show that the, the earth is not the center of the universe, and that's a mathematical story. And Copernicus is... Uh, book, uh, De Revolutionibus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can't do the Latin perfectly off, off the cuff. Um, the, uh, uh, his book um, was really a mathematical book that used kind of mathematical and geometric ideas to argue that the science, aka the mathematical science, shows you something that the world can be thought of a little bit as sort of mathematical or geometrical in some sense, all the way down, more so that it can be thought of as something where it is merely structural, the, the earlier paradigm, as something where we can really say it is put together with crystal spheres and, and all this kind of thing. So in a sense, the physics project uh, tells one, uh, at the time of Copernicus, one already knew, one had known about mathematics for 1500 
2,000 years, one had had ideas of mathematics. People had talked about uh, you know, the solution of polynomial equations. People had discussed algebra. People had, there was lots that had been done in kind of the mathematical uh, framework. But the question of whether our actual world is mathematical was not something that was, was it was clear that you could use mathematics to compute things. Ptolemy had done that. The Babylonians had done that. But the fact that you should trust the mathematics rather than trusting your kind of belief about the world, that was something which I think the sort of Copernican uh, discoveries um, kind of really led to. And I think this, this idea that sort of it could be mathematical all the way down, and that's the story, rather than it's structural and we can think about it uh, in, in sort of intuitive terms, is, is what came out of that. And I think the, the realization that it really does seem that the universe, that a physical, the physical universe is computational all the way down, kind of forces us to think that, yes, it really is the case that we should think in computational terms about everything. And the question of whether we are exposed to computation, are we exposed to the sophistication of raw computation? Mostly physics, for example, has shied away from those things. Physics has thought about those kinds of things that are understandable, explainable, um, without sort of having in your face computational irreducibility. Possibly fluid turbulence is one of the examples where you do have sort of in your face computational irreducibility, but it's one that physics for the most part has tended to avoid. Um, but in any case, that, that's, um, uh, that's kind of the, the uh, I think the significance of the physics project uh, kind of philosophically in a sense is the, the idea that things are computational all the way down and this notion of thinking about the world computationally is not just a can be done, but it's a something that so, in, some, in some fundamental ontological sense is what one has to do. Well, let's see. Uh, I guess I, I, I'm, um, there's, uh, there's more that I can talk about, about um, kind of the, um, um, the sort of the arrival of this fourth paradigm that's emerged that builds on the, the paradigm of, of NKS. I, I, I could mention also the the process of doing science, and um, uh, you know how that's evolved. And and I would say that the for me NKS was made possible by Wolfram Language and Mathematica, and it was made possible by other science I'd done previously. But more than anything, it was made possible by the technology. It was also made possible by my personal environment that. Uh, you know, I wasn't writing grant proposals for the next incremental piece of science. I got to bite off a very big piece and chew it for, for a decade um, and uh, try and produce something useful from that. Um, the, the thing that I did in that case was very hermetic science, so to speak. I was just you know, sort of uh, separated from the world and just trying to get on with what I was doing. Um, it's interesting that in the in the 20 years since then, there are sort of new aspects of the world that have emerged, particularly things like you know live streaming and the web and all those kinds of things. And I think that uh, uh, one of the things that has become clear now is that we are. It's possible to do science at a, in a meta, in a different way. It's sort of a meta level. I mean, for example, this idea of live streaming incremental progress in science and the actual working process of doing science is something which we couldn't even think of 30 years ago. Um, but it's something which I think, uh, you know, I've been doing that uh, uh, in recent times as we've been live streaming uh, the uh, design of our computational language and so on. It's, it's sort of interesting. We've been doing that for three or four years now and uh, sort of still unique in the world of, of uh, even technology development, let alone science. Um, and I don't know whether that's just because I'm, I'm the bigger fool than anybody else, or I'm prepared to uh, make a fool of myself in public more easily than other people are to actually do those raw kind of uh, frontline kinds of, uh, of, of investigations of things. But I think it's a, it's a rather interesting process that um, uh, is, a, is a new piece of the, of, the, of the story of doing science. And I think one of the things that I've been interested in now, and we've just been starting our Wolfram Institute to try and make use of kind of the methodology that we've developed for doing kind of managed science, um, doing something where uh, really what it comes down to is 
you know, I've been CEOing a company for more than half my life. And, you know, what do you do when you CEO a company? You basically define leadership and you, you kind of, you pull things in a certain direction. You create a vision for what should be done. You define a strategy. You try and get it executed. If you built the right kind of machine as a company, you can successfully execute things. For science, it's, I believe, the same kind of thing. And that's what I did for myself in, in the NKS book, what I've now done with the group I've been working with on the physics project and the mathematics project and so on, is, is define the vision of what is possible and exercise the leadership to try and make that actually happen. And that's something a little bit different from a common view of sort of the progress of science, which tends to be more of a, you know, have a have a whole herd of feral cats, so to speak, and eventually one of them will kind of jump up and um, and, and discover something interesting. This is more a uh, uh, a kind of a a, a, um, uh, a a lead kind of thing, and that's what we're 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 building for Wolfram Institute. Um, and uh, but I think that there are mechanisms that we can see, and I think a whole a whole class of new mechanisms that I am yet to really understand with clarity. But part of it has to do with the the well. There's several components. There's live streaming as a way to kind of see what's happening. Then there's computational language, which is a critical piece of of it's kind of the insofar as in economics, uh, money is the liquid form of exchange. It's the numeraire. It's the thing that allows one to say, we have apples, we have oranges. They both have a price. They're both interconvertible in some sense. So similarly with ideas, I think what is emerging is this notion that computational language is the kind of analog of that for ideas. It is the thing that allows ideas to sort of operate in this in a more liquid way than in the in the notion of here's an idea, it's embedded in this piece of written text, and that's all there is to it. It's something where there's a sort of certain liquidity to it. I haven't really fully understood this yet. Um, it's something where I think we are slowly get, getting to a point where we understand also things about, well, yes, you can talk about it in terms of blockchain and DAOs and NFTs and things like that. But really what it is, is the value that exists in basic science and the question is, how should that value be operated in the world? We have, you know, we understand the value of technology. We understand the value of intellectual property of various kinds. But what about sort of scientific basic research ideas? What is the, what is the character of their value, which most people would believe that they have a value, a societal value, rather a high societal value, actually a very high societal value. But how is that value actually uh, realized and operated? And how does the existence of that value uh, redound to the benefit of, of the creation of further value um, along those lines? I mean, in, in, um, and, and that's kind of a story of kind of how do you invent something? In a sense, the model that we have, well, the model of universities that we have which in part dates from the 1200s, but I think in its more recent form dates from sometime post-World War II um, of, uh, of kind of the university as partly a conveyor of knowledge and partly as a research organization, so to speak. And it's it's sort of gone through twists and turns. I mean, my own adventures with universities as, as a professor and so on back in the in the early 1980s and so on. And uh, the the kind of uh, the, the awkward uh, merger for a time of kind of the technology and intellectual property and commercial world um, with the with that sort of academic world um, that's slowly gotten itself, I think, better worked out. Um, but it's kind of like where, how does all this stuff fit together? And how do you create not only a new kind of science, but also a new way to do science? And I think we're slowly seeing the emergence of that. And it's interesting to see the extent to which the content of the science, the change of paradigms, things like the computational paradigm, the importance of computational language as sort of a, a liquid mechanism for, for interchange in science, and the very fact that computation is, is a key part of the emerging kind of view of science, how that all plays together and creates something which I think will be, uh, you know, I, th I think there is, there is something to be figured out now, not only we have kind of NKS, we have the computational paradigm, we now have the multi-computational paradigm and the extremely fertile set of possibilities that it provides 
in terms of understanding uh, a lot of different kinds of fields. And we also are beginning to see, possibly related to the content of the science, possibly even making use of ideas from the science, the emergence of this kind of new kind of way to think about doing science. And so I think that's uh, that's another thing that we have to understand. And I think that new kind of way of doing science will both sort of uh, in internalize things like computational irreducibility. It will internalize that, and but also make use of the things that we now understand about the world uh, from the practicalities of, of computation and blockchain and so on uh, to see how to sort of uh, move forward in a way that is a little different perhaps from what has been the tradition, the increasingly large tradition of uh, of things like the, the current academic enterprise. So that's something that uh, been actively thinking about. It's something that with the Wolfram Institute, we're starting it in a fairly traditional way. Um, I'm happy to say that our uh, philanthropic efforts of of, um, uh, of getting um, support for the institute have been going rather well, um, and uh, we look forward looking forward to to seeing just um, uh, how effectively we can we can launch the institute um, and how much we can make use of kind of this this managed research concept that was was really very successful for NKS for the physics project the mathematics project and so on and is is sort of based on what I've developed over the past 35, 40 years. Um, in uh, in in the in setting up innovation and R and D at our company. All right, let's see. Well, I think that was almost all I had to say here. And um, this is a, a holiday day in the U.S. Um, and uh, although I seem to be busier than ever today, um, I think there might have been some comments here. Let me see if I can uh, pull this up and address some of them. Um, Well, let's see. Uh, okay, a few quick ones from Eric. Will quantum computers help us break computational irreducibility? Uh, the answer I believe is no. The reasons are quite subtle. I mean, basically multi-computation is the essence of what one should be thinking about when one thinks of quantum computation. But the difficulty is to take all those threads of history that are happening at a multi-computational level and turn them into something that we say is an answer. And that requires kind of knitting together all those threads of history. And that process of measurement itself takes that effort. So it isn't the case that we can, that doesn't come for free. That's still subject to the story of computational redu irreducibility. Actually, that's an interesting, interesting kind of way to think about it, perhaps, that tacked on to the end of an essentially multi-computational process is something which has is a computational process, kind of, kind of single, single minding it, so that it is an answer that we say is an individual answer, rather than just saying it's this complicated entangled quantum state. We say, and the answer is this. But getting to the answer is this is a computationally irreducible process, and I think that's in the end the the kind of the confusion of quantum computation is that yes, there is a there, there is this multi computational process but you don't get to have access to it without going through something which is a traditional computationally irreducible process. Um, Parker asked, how far ahead of its time is the idea of computational irreducibility in the physics project? What are some of its implications? You know, this how far ahead of its time is something, it's horrifying. I mean, you know, it's, if I look at, let's say the early days of computation, combinators, 1920. We still don't understand them very well. They're still ahead of their time. There's still things that we are edging towards. I mean, I myself over the last 40 years have done things that make use of kind of a, 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 a sort of the, the core ideas of things like combinators and, and so on in building symbolic computation and um, in building this idea of transformation rules and symbolic expressions as a, as a computational language. But there's still things we really don't understand even from that time. I think that um, uh, if I look today, uh, some of the work that's done particularly by my friend Greg Chaitin on algorithmic information theory from the early 1960s, uh, it sort of got somewhat understood by the 1970s and 80s, but there's sort of a, a, a realization, oh, that might be relevant to natural science. I think it's a little too late. It's taken 60 years, but I think that the, the idea of algorithmic information theory that 
it in order to get complex things, you need complex programs. That idea just isn't true for our universe. And that's in a sense what the whole story of NKS and computational irreducibility and so on were all about. No, you don't need complicated programs to get complicated behavior. It's something I've discussed with, with Greg Chaitin forever. You know, is the universe like pi, like the digits of pi that can be generated from a simple program, or like omega, capital omega, this uh, concept of Greg's that is something inaccessible to uh, to to ordinary computation. It's uh, about oracles for halting machines, for uh, halting uh, problems of Turing machines and things like that. So it is a little bit shocking to me that 60 years after algorithmic information theory, people are like, oh yes, it's relevant to natural science. Well, you kind of missed the boat a bit because we've kind of known for almost 40 years the extent to which that's the physical universe while computational, but while while algorithmic information theory is of high interest conceptually, I don't think it's the thing of relevance directly to natural science. Just to say something which is a very recent realization is that it's um, it's kind of a um, uh, the um, 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 it's something where okay, so this is this gets a little bit in the deep philosophical kind of area of things. The Ruliad is this unique thing that is the uh, limit of all possible entangled computations. But one thing that's required for the Ruliad not to collapse is that the EMs, the individual atoms of existence that are the sort of raw data structure of those computations, the EMs have a notion of uniqueness. That is, you can distinguish two different EMs, two different atoms of existence, and you can know that they're different. But that knowing that they're different is not something accessible to the Ruliad. The knowing that they're different is actually something that requires the hyper Ruliad to, you can have a belief in the Ruliad that the Eames are distinct, but in a sense to know that you have to go outside the Ruliad. And so in a sense, the, the Ruliad, I think in some sense is supported on an infinite tower of hyper Ruliads that are necessary for the existence of these Eames as being uh, distinct, uh, the uniqueness of Eames as a consequence of the, of the inaccessible, completely inaccessible to us, existence of an infinite tower of hyper uh, That That sounds very bizarre. It sounds almost sort of theological and um, uh, in, its, uh, in its structure. And perhaps there are even, there is even thinking from, um, uh, you know, 500,000 years ago or more before the current scientific era um, of sort of the logical consequences of thinking in those kinds of ways. And I, I, I still have to untangle that. Um, but, but so this, um, the kind of um, uh, that, that sort of thing, well, okay. So the question was about how far ahead of its time is, is the stuff we're doing. You know, it's, it's a little bit disturbing in a sense that a lot of things I've invented in technology even, uh, there certainly are people who understand and use them as kind of a superpower every day. Um, but there's a lot that I invented 40 years ago that is not even close to being being widely absorbed. And even some of the more uh, the sort of or even even the more uh, sort of cautionary moments, things like the idea of notebooks that we invented, whatever it was, 35 years ago now, finally sort of got popular. It's like everybody knows about these now. But that took 28 years. And I consider that a very elementary idea. And you know, I think it is, it is shocking how long it takes for ideas to really get absorbed in the world. And, and I, I think that uh, what efforts one makes to sort of clarify those ideas certainly can accelerate that. Uh, I don't know whether there are things that, for example, the physics project, I kind of think is something that arrived in its time for reasons of, 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 of chance almost, but it could have taken another 50 years or 100 years for, for these ideas to have emerged. And I think you know, the physics project I view as being kind of the next step after the things that happened about 100 years ago in the creation of general relativity and quantum mechanics and the framework for physics that we have today and, and statistical mechanics of, of even slightly earlier than that. I think also the metamathematics, the physicalization of metamathematics is kind of a step beyond what happened about 100 years ago in, in, the, in thinking about metamathematics. Those timescales are horrifyingly long. You know, us humans live lives that are shorter than that typically. And it is, it is shocking how many 
sort of generations of inter intellectual generations uh, get fitted in. And of course, the difficulty with intellectual generations is when people who invent something are around, they are only too aware often of the limitations of what they invent. And they're capable potentially of, uh, of at least entertaining the possibility of things that change what they've learned. By the time you're five, seven, 10, you know, intellectual generations later, people have mostly decided that's just the way things are. That is the accepted canon and there is no difference. And it becomes much more difficult to see sort of, well, actually those foundations might not be right and to see off in a different direction. So the fact that these timescales for absorption of ideas are so long compared to uh, kind of human timescales is something which is kind of a complicated feature of, of sort of the advance of science. So I, I think, I mean, in terms of, of the physics project and so on, um, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, what we're seeing right now with this multi-computation paradigm, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that in the next few years we will see rapid progress in a whole bunch of areas uh, where we're just able to plug in this new paradigm, just like we were able to plug in the computational paradigm, but it ran into computational irreducibility. The multi-computational paradigm has a different character. And for observers, there is the possibility of, of coming out with laws that are much more like the traditional, almost mathematical laws that um, emerged through this kind of tower of multi-computation followed by observation. Uh, okay, Paul asks, if I were to look at the NKS book, would I have published it as a book today or as some much more fragmented thing? Interesting question. I think the book idea is a good idea. And I have to say, even in things that I've done recently, I've been keen you know, for example, with our physics project, I collected sort of the launch papers into a book. I think books are a pretty good thing for us humans because they represent, you know, you have a book, you know, this is it. There's a few inches of paper. This is what there is. It's not something where you go and you explore, you know, these are the, the tentacles, the tendrils of, of what you can see. Now, I, I know in, for example, in Wolfram Language, uh, I had written books about how it works up until um, uh, version version five. Um, in uh, uh, that was up until about two thousand three, and and then it just got too big. I mean, the book had expanded to two thousand five hundred pages, I think, and um, the uh, uh, it would now be two hundred thousand pages. And in a sense, something was a little bit lost from that. You don't get to wrap your arms intellectually around the subject matter. It's like there are always tentacles to follow. I've tried to write, I wrote a little book called Elementary Introduction to Wolfram Language, which is sort of a, a little, that's a very small creature that you can wrap your arms around, so to speak. Not the whole story, but at least a small part of it. So I, I do really like the idea of books as units of, of intellectual sort of uh, communication. Um, I think that fragmenting, I mean, originally with the NKS book, I could have written the NKS book as 400 papers or some number of papers. It would have been much less useful, much, much, much less useful. Everyone would have repeated kind of a chorus uh, of, of sort of introduction, but nobody would have gotten the point. And really to get a big sort of intellectual idea, you need to have sort of everything collected together. And I think that that's some... Um, uh, uh, and even, even when I think about kind of summarizing pieces of the NKS book, yes, you can summarize pieces of it, but nobody will really be able to dig through them without knowing more of that backup, nor of the, more of the detailed story. You can kind of just explain computational irreducibility. It's not hard to explain, but why is this true? How does it really relate to things? That's a bigger story, and that requires something more, more bookish, so to speak. Abhi asks us, what's the next step after NKS? Well, it's really been the physics project and the multi-computational paradigm. And um, that's uh, it's pretty exciting. I, you know, I, I feel greedy that if I look at these paradigms in science from the sort of structural one from antiquity to the mathematical one from the 1600s, to have been involved in, in the one, in the computational one in the 1980s going into the NKS book, that's pretty neat. That's a pretty nice thing. I'm I'm pretty excited to have lived at a time in history when that's possible. 
to be involved in two sort of paradigms, changed paradigms in the way one thinks about science feels very greedy. But I think that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, 40 years after the computational paradigm, we're seeing sort of the emergence of this multi-computational paradigm, which I hope will accelerate over the next few years. Um, and uh, that's kind of the next step as far as I'm concerned. Um, let's see, Aaron asks, how is interest in NKS varied across different regions of the world? That is a very interesting question. Um, it's, we've studied that a bit and we're about to study it again because we've been collecting people who've done really logical research and seeing where their papers are from, you know, where, where are they based? It's, it's all over, but it's not deeply concentrated in the places where a lot of sort of the front lines of science in, of North America, Western Europe, things like that have traditionally been. There's a lot of stuff in, oh, I don't know, there's a lot of really logical stuff in Japan, South America. Um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of places. There's, there's sort of, I would say, there is the possibility of, of fertile work in these areas in places that are not part of the more, most traditional kind of frontline of science type areas. Um, I mean, it's always an interesting thing. You know, I've seen it in, in technology of, you know, oh yeah, well, most of the innovative software companies are in, are in the US. Um, that's just the way that, that's the way that's evolved. Why is that? Why does it, doesn't even make any sense, one might think. Um, and sort of, and it's an interesting process that that leads that, that 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 to happen. What is it that is fertile about the U.S. in terms of those kinds of things? Um, and uh, uh, what? And so, when it comes to NKS, uh, I've been very curious about that. You know, I look at our summer schools, for example, over the last twenty years, and it is a remarkable uh, kind of almost you know United Nations slice of of countries around the world including so many that, that you just don't see, you know, the Madagascars and Indonesias and um, uh, places that are, uh, you know, and, and uh, all the places in South America and, and uh, particularly, I don't know, a, a certain, I'm trying to think of others, I'm, I'm not, um, we've just had a, a tremendous diversity of places that are not the places where you usually say, oh, that's a place where sort of the next piece of science is going to happen. So that's been very interesting to see. I don't, I don't think it's not like we've, we've, I mean, I'm very happy to see it, but it's not something that I think we've had any active effort to cause to happen, but it's something that, um, that has happened. And I think that, that um, I, I'll be very interested to see as we uh, push forward with the kind of organization of ruleology as a field, um, how it is geographically distributed. Um, and as I, as I say, I, I've been, um, uh, in some ways, the, um, I mean, it, the U.S. Is, is, is always kind of complicated because so many people in the U.S. didn't start their education in the U.S. And so what, what seems like it's sort of a U.S. Uh, kind of based uh, piece of innovation, in a sense, was from people whose early, perhaps formative education was elsewhere. Um, but anyway, so the, the interesting question, I don't know, don't know the answer. Um, Aaron asks, why are the margins of the typeset pages in NKS so large? I actually explained that in the, in the, in, in the piece about the making of, of the book. Basically, the story is, if you make the text, we, we needed the pages to be wide to fit wide pictures, but we couldn't make the text wide because it becomes unreadable if it's wide. The only way you can have really wide text on a page is to have multiple columns, but that really makes it super difficult to have a flow that works with big pictures. So it was the pictures force the width of the book, but the readability of the text forces the narrowness of the of the columns, which means there's there's empty space on the edges, and uh, that's uh, yes you can you can I haven't really it's sort of a waste of paper at some level, but it's uh, it's necessary I think for the uh, uh, as part of the sort of ability to absorb what's there. Um. Will ruleology and uh, sort of the multi-computational paradigm have things to say about biological evolution? I absolutely think so. Um, I wrote a little bit about that in the piece that I wrote about multi-computation, um, but um, uh, that's, um, that's something to come. Uh, okay, so Evan 
can't read. Um, what are influential books of the past that make you think a book is the best format for a new kind of science? That's interesting. I mean, look, there are there are plenty of books that have been the the things that defined fields. I mean, from just so many. I mean, the, the fields are, are sometimes defined by sort of a more gradual process or by the sort of the anchor paper, but that's that's the exception, I would say. You know, whether it's whether it's Copernicus or or you know or, or uh, Newton's Principia or whether it's um, um, you know Laplace's celestial mechanics or whether it's uh, well Maxwell wrote some of his stuff originally in papers. Um, he then wrote a textbook of electromagnetism, and uh, you know that, there's just a whole series of of these things where where big ideas have arrived in in, in books. Now, in modern times, uh, that's not the way it's worked. In modern times, people think that the academic enterprise is an incremental one where new things should always arise in kind of incremental papers. Um, that's something that was a mold that I rather broke for the NKS book. I think I had no choice but to break it because I think it's not really deliverable in, in sort of those fragmentary pieces. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, one can one can name many sort of classic books of, of the past um, that really delivered things in sort of a, in, in a book amount of stuff rather than a, a paper amount of stuff. Um, uh, so Aaron asks, can I imagine a future computational explorer having a breakthrough so large that they write a new kind of ruleology? Yes, I absolutely can. It is in a sense, I didn't imagine the multi-computational kind of breakthrough. So uh, in a sense, one never imagines these things until they are upon one. Um, but can I at a meta level imagine it? Absolutely. I think that that it is the story of the progression of science is the story of finding more that we can say kind of out in rural space, finding another place to colonize. And the, 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 the challenge is often as much to define what one cares about as it is to do the sort of mechanics and technology of, of, uh, of, of developing things. I mean, the very fact that we care about computational irreducibility, complex things about which we cannot have certain kinds of narratives, that in and of itself, that new thing we care about is a defining feature that gets one to a new kind of science. And so the question of what we care about in the future as we explore the Ruliad, so to speak, is, a, is an interesting question, which is a sort of a mixed question of us as the human experience, so to speak, and, um, uh, and, and sort of the, 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 uh, uh, the future of what we can explore scientifically. I mean, I think that, you know, what we care about as humans has been, you know, I, I think it'll be a, it, it's a fascinating thing to kind of imagine you know, if you imagine some future world in which there are lots of, you know, uploaded sort of disembodied human souls, so to speak, uploaded in some digital, uh, uh, you know, uh, matrix, so to speak, um, you know, what will those souls care about? And maybe some of the things they'll care about are vastly different from the things that we care about today. Um, and so as there are different things to care about, so there are different things about one can make us about which one can make a science, and I think that's that's kind of in a sense the great frontier there. Um, and to have a jump on what one might care about, and to define that possibly even gets one to the point where one cares about it. To say this is a thing about which one can do science. That's in a sense what I was doing with a new kind of science, is is to define a new kind of set of things that one can care about. Um, I think that. Uh, one of the things that might be an ultimate irony is, you know, in that kind of vision of kind of the the disembodied kind of uh, you know explore the Ruliad kind of kind of existence, um, the thing that in a sense makes us exist and makes us have our experience is the specificity of us and the fact that as as soon as we start broadly exploring the Ruliad, in some sense. The specificity that we can that makes us into something where we can sort of feel that we exist somehow evaporates, and so in a sense it becomes this irony that as we explore broadly, more and more broadly, and our technology extends more and more to other parts of rural space and so on, the 
the coherence that we have that makes us feel that we exist disappears. And so I think that's that's kind of the, um, uh, you know, that's, a, and I haven't thought this through properly, I don't really know how all that works. And, and no doubt there are rivers of continued existence that um, uh, are there, independent of this kind of, you know, this puffing out of this kind of ball of potentiality that um, that leads one to something where there isn't the same sort of uh, solid thread of existence. So anyway, that's a that's um, uh, um, that's a very uh, um, um, that's a uh, that gets very deeply philosophical. I, I see Petra making comment here about some um, hyperreliads. I, I I kind of think. Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, in a sense, I, I, I'm just at a very early stage in, in thinking through the kind of full philosophical implications of these uh, these ways of thinking about things. And I, I, I do feel that there are, is probably resonance with quite, quite a lot of other philosophical thinking that's been done in the past, um, maybe thinking that's been done outside of the domain of science. Um, but I don't really know how those pieces fit together. And I, and I, I do feel that there are uh, yes, there are real breakthroughs to be made, and uh, it's it's almost um, one of the things that I would consider sort of an embarrassment of my own efforts is, you know, I was showing you earlier, 1992, you know, looking at multi-computation, multi-way Turing machines, things like that. I didn't get the point of that for 30 more years, and it's these seeds that you start to see of things that are, oh, that's kind of interesting. That seed of it's kind of interesting might grow into a giant forest of a, of a serious kind of science. And I, you know, where those seeds are, which are the right seeds to pick up? That's a really interesting question. And I have, I, I have explored a few of those seeds. And in a sense, the, the efforts that I have of sort of expand the footnote of NKS into a hundred page document, is a, an attempt to kind of to kind of um, uh, sort of understand what's there already in the ground in those seeds, um, and uh, anyway, well, I should probably wrap up here. And um, uh, for those in the U.S., happy Memorial Day, so to speak. Um, and uh, uh, I think that probably concludes this series of um, explorations of uh, the new kind of science book and its implications. Um, we'll, we are, I'm always trying to think about um, what the best format to kind of share ideas and, and have discussions is, and I'll be interested in feedback about that. I'd like to remind people that um, I've been doing uh, twice a week, I've been doing kind of Q&A live streams. Um, on Wednesdays, I've been alternating between Q&A about history of science and technology, um, together with uh, uh, business innovation and managing life. And then on Fridays, I've been doing a uh, Q&A about science and technology for kids and others. Um, and uh, um, I see uh, a comment here uh, from Eric saying that, that they like the way I use these live streams to discuss progress in science. Uh, it really helps me. I mean, and, and is commenting that um, more scientists should, should do this. Yeah, well, you know, it's. I suppose that in my life, in, in so far as I've been able to make progress in, in science and other kinds of intellectual endeavors, I gradually discover tools, and it always surprises me that other people don't use these tools. I mean, I discovered computers as a tool for doing things like physics back in the 1970s. I was very surprised that other people didn't use those tools. Um, I think that this tool of sort of in a sense, real-time exposition and exploration is something which for me is working really well. I've, you know, I, I, of the things that I have uh, invented, discovered recently, I think the majority of them are things that were at least stimulated, if not actually worked out, if not actually, you know, really conceptualized when I'm trying to explain things to people. In fact, in this live stream today, I've kind of made little mental notes to myself of at least three things that have come up here where I never thought of that explanation before, and it's a good way to think about things. And so it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have to thank uh, you all for, for um, 
kind of participating in this in this sort of effort. But yes, it's it's a very I think it's a very valuable tool, and I you know other people should do it too. But you know I thought other people should use kind of the computational tools that existed. Finally, I built a version of that in, in Mathematica that was sort of uh, ergonomic enough that lots of people could use it. Um, but uh, uh, it's it's an interesting um, um, uh, it's it's a interesting process that I I would say I, I I think would be valuable for a lot of other people to to use. Although I I will admit, as I said earlier, that in a sense this process is one that um, uh, uh, you know you, you have to have a certain degree of intellectual confidence because you know I am I know that if I am uh, sort of exploring things for the first time in, in a live stream, I'm not going to get it perfect the first time. And, uh, you know, I have to be be confident enough to not have that be something that um, that uh, that troubles me. All right. Well, we should wrap up here. But thank you very much for, for joining me and for helping me understand things better. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all again on another live stream soon. All right.